Good afternoon to all of you. My, my wife basically says that I can't keep a job. That's her explanation for, for all these different roles. Um, let me thank a few people in addition to John. Um, Sally Benson and, and Arun Sundaram just walked in, the, the, dep uh, the co-directors of the Precourt Center, and uh, both real experts in carbon capture, so I'm a bit intimidated on the technical side. David Hayes, a colleague at the law school, uh, most recently, the Deputy Secretary of the Interior and Chief Operating Officer at Interior. David knows about federal land, so I better not blow that. It's a big audience, and, I, and all the rest of you know a lot more on the technical side than I do. But I do know a little bit about the policy and finance dimensions of, of clean energy, and that's what I want to talk to you particularly about in the context of, of carbon capture. So we are here motivated by one of the great existential challenges of our time, which is how do we deal with this odorless, colorless, transparent gas, which they've changed in this slide, uh, called CO2. And let me start with uh, two ways that I don't think we should get at this carbon dioxide problem as it manifests itself in climate change. <laughs> I love the New Yorker. They always cut right to the chase. Sorry, Harold, but I'm reducing our carbon footprint. And I also don't think this is the way we're going to do it, even at a great university like, like Stanford. Just hope for a miracle. Yeah. So let me put up what I think is the approach that we really do need to take, which is my favorite triangle when it comes to a sustainable energy future we've got to make progress at three, in three key areas, technology, policy, and finance. Whatever the challenge, whatever the technological response, we need to do great science and engineering, but if we don't back that up with smart policy and huge amounts of low-cost capital, we're not going to get to where we need to get. Much of what we're doing in the energy area is not the next app. It's a lot harder, it takes a lot longer, there's a lot more money involved. And this is what's motivated me working my way around this triangle. And when I, when I teach uh, courses that are listed both in the business school and the law school, I say to folks there, if you want to get involved in clean tech, get smart at policy, get smart in finance, and work with a smart technologist, if you pull all three of those things together, you're going to have the greatest chance of actually getting something to market and get it to scale and have it make a difference and maybe make some money. So that's, that's the context in which I like to talk about all of this. So carbon capture, let's just start with a few of the basic numbers. I think many of you know this, but this is our emissions profile writ large across our economy, focus in particular on electricity and industry. Those are the two pieces of the carbon dioxide pie we're gonna talk about today. I think you know on the electricity side, it's, it's coal and it's gas. Uh, emissions, coal coming down, gas going up when it comes to our electricity supply. Who knows where those lines are going to go over the next couple of decades, but those are going to be the big two sources of carbon dioxide in the electricity sector. China, obviously, a big contributor. Uh, this was a 2014 chart, obviously, in in going to Paris, the Chinese have now committed to level off their emissions in 20, by 2030. But still, growth there, massive emissions, um, and obviously something that we've got to get at. India, coal, far and away the largest contributor there. But look at number two. It's petroleum. It's petroleum that's used in essentially diesel generators. That's a very big chunk of their carbon emissions <laughs> profile. So, these are the emissions we need to be looking at. It's, again, it's the power sector. It's also the industrial sector. California is an interesting case. I said to myself, what are the biggest individual emitters of carbon dioxide in the state of California? Um, and what you get to quickly is transportation. But look at power and industrial. And then if you look at the top individual emitters, it's not power generating plants, it actually turns out to be refineries. Uh, we've done a good job in this state in cutting carbon emissions, the move from coal to gas, the move to renewables. What we've got left are some big, very big industrial emitters. 
So industry and electricity, that's where these carbon emissions are coming from that we're going to ask CCS to deal with. Carbon, die, carbon capture and sequestration is a key climate change strategy. You ask the IPCC, you ask the International Energy Agency, all the big reviews that have been done to date on how we're going to get at this problem, this is the pie chart you see. We've got to make great progress in improving efficiency in our energy system. We've got to accelerate the deployment of renewables. Uh, we, nuclear has a role to play. That was a recent talk in this seminar done by John Deutsch. End use fuel switching and CCS. CCS is a piece if we're going to have any chance of staying within that two, two degree C trajectory, CCS has got to be a piece of this. On the other hand, it's been a real struggle. This was a headline last week on NPR here in California. Carbon capture flops in California despite millions in investment. I think this is too negative a view. I think we've actually made some pretty good progress, but we're definitely not there when it comes to full-scale, cost-effective deployment of CCS. And that's what I want to address in the next few minutes. So what are we talking about? We're talking about capturing carbon dioxide from power plants and industrial sources. Again, those two pieces of the pie. And we do that in four different ways. Pre-combustion, post-combustion, oxy-fired combustion, and then getting at high concentration streams of CO2. We pump it deep beneath the surface of the Earth, a kilometer or more. And we do that in two different places, saline aquifers and using it in enhanced oil recovery, putting it into old oil fields to enhance their production. So that's kind of the technology in one slide. And what I want to do very quickly is walk through those four top bullets and then start to talk about the policy and finance dimension. So pre-combustion, take coal, gasify it, you've got a CO2 stream, and then you've got a hydrogen stream. Use the hydrogen stream in a com combined cycle gas turbine and make electricity. This was this was the major focus in the US up until recently. This was an approach in future gen, as it's been called in the federal government. The big plant is the Kemper project in Mississippi. It has run into real problems, big cost overruns. It'll get done, it should operate, but it has not been the real approach that I think going forward we're gonna be focused on. One of the reasons is when we started down this road, what we thought we were doing was gasifying coal and competing with natural gas when natural gas was very high in price. When we had an era of eight, 10, $12 a thousand cubic feet gas. As most of you know, that era is gone and we're looking at gas at two and three dollars a thousand cubic feet. So starting with coal and gasifying it doesn't make that much sense in the way that it did 10, 20 years ago. Instead of pre-combustion, we're now looking at post-combustion. Pull the CO2 off the back end, for example, of a coal-fired power plant. Pull it out of an ethanol plant. That's post-combustion capture. So the Boundary Dam pro project in Saskatchewan, up and running, uh, as of 2014, pulling CO2 off of a large portion of a major coal-fired power plant in that province. A major project that NRG, the big independent power producer here in the United States, is building in Texas. One of four large units of a coal-fired power plant in Parrish, Texas. NRG has created a subsidiary called Petronova which is building this project, and it'll be online this year. You can do post-combustion at an oil refinery. Remember that chart where I said in California, the largest proportion of individual facility CO2 emissions actually come from refineries, not from power plants. So we're going to have to begin to think about projects like this in places like California as this project was built in Port Arthur, Texas, and is capturing post-combustion 
from a refinery. And then what I think is the most interesting, we're going to move to oxy combustion. This was an announcement made in 2014 by Exelon, one of the big investor-owned utilities in the United States, that they are building a carbon capture project with a natural gas-fired power plant using oxy combustion. That was a big step for a mainstream utility to announce we're not only looking at coal, we're now looking at natural gas when it comes to carbon <coughs> capture. So that's post-combustion. Now let's turn to these high concentration CO2 streams. Wow, that's a lousy picture. <laughs> this is after you've had the ethanol. <laughs> Something like that. So, you know, when you make beer or when you make ethanol, that stuff that bubbles off the top is a pretty pure stream of CO2. And what we've begun to do in this country, Archer Daniels Midland is, is one of the first, is actually to capture this CO2. And at a project in Illinois, they've been doing that for the last couple of years and pumping it into a deep saline aquifer. Very pure stream. The chemistry is... is is less complicated when you pull this off, and it's a pretty big source. And if you start to look at ethanol production in the US, it's not insignificant as a CO2 source, and as I say, very easy to get at. And then internationally, there's a number of projects. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there are scores and scores of them, but there are a decent number of projects being built and operating around the world focused on both these industrial and electricity generating systems. So carbon capture is moving along, not only in the US, but in, in other parts of the world, in other countries. All right, so you've captured it. What do you do with it now? Well, one thing you can do is pump it deep into a saline aquifer. That is what they're doing in the Archer Daniels Midland plant in Illinois. But where the better economics today come from is using this CO2 to revive old oil fields in what's called enhanced oil recovery, or, or EOR. You take that CO2 that you've captured, and you pump it into an old oil field, and you use it to revive the field in simple, in simple terms. And I was surprised to learn a couple of years ago as I began to get interested in this that it's roughly 5% of, of US oil has been produced using enhanced oil recovery. But the interesting thing is that the CO2 that we've been using is not man-made CO2 pulled off of a power plant. It's actually naturally occurring CO2 in big domes of CO2 in places like New Mexico and Colorado that gets pumped down to places like Texas in big lines and is used in old oil fields. But curious, equally curious, we are quote unquote running out of this natural CO2. <laughs> Little did I know. We even had the big quantities in natural quantities and now we're running out of it so it's a good thing to go be looking at these man-made sources in power plants and that's in fact what we're doing. So. People far smarter than I am technically have said, we can put this stuff in underground. We can push this old oil field out, old oil out of these, these older oil fields, and it stuff is basically going to stay there for a long period of time. That's the, the, layman's, the layman's take on enhanced oil recovery, and I think, I think things have worked pretty well in that context. Um, and as a result, we've reduced our need to go into new oil fields by pulling oil fields out of these older depleted ones. So there are some environmental upsides to that. And I was also surprised to learn there are a few thousand miles of CO2 pipelines, particularly running around the southwest, including Texas. Um, now, CO2 in this context has real value, and it's typically priced as a percentage of oil with one ton of CO2 priced at approximately 30% of the current oil price for a barrel. So if oil is at $100 a barrel, CO2 costs 30 to 40. Obviously, as oil is $30 a barrel, CO2 is a lot less. And we'll see the consequence of that in one second. I was also surprised to learn just how much oil we've got in these existing fields in the United States and the potential to drive more of it out and again not have to go drill in new places. So a place like the Permian Basin, 20.8 billion barrels technically recoverable with CO2, 
total US oil consumption is roughly 7 billion barrels a year, something on that order. So, you know, two and a half to three years worth of US oil consumption technically recoverable from this field. And you can look at the, at the range there. So this is not insignificant. Um, so, but people will frequently say, well, wait a second, we're taking CO2 and we're putting it in the ground and then we're driving out oil and we're going to burn this oil and we're going to put CO2 back up into the atmosphere. And you sort of say, what are we doing here? I, I took the, the qualitative approach to this and I said, all right, let's look at two scenarios. One, you burn coal in Texas and you put it up in the atmosphere. Meanwhile, let's pick tar sands up in Alberta. You mine the tar sands. You produce this substance called bitumen. Some CO2 is released. You refine this, the bitumen with hydrogen. It's self-produced from natural gas where CO2 is released. To produce oil, CO2 released. You burn the oil and the CO2 is released. Two different CO2 contexts. But what if you burn coal in Texas and you captured that CO2, you ran it in one of those existing pipelines, you injected that CO2 to revive an old Texas oil field to produce CO2, and then of course that CO2 is released. I think if you run the numbers on those two, the latter is in fact, as I've got it here, a greener approach to meeting those kinds of economic needs. Now I'm sure there's people more technically capable than I am that will poke holes in this, but I think this is basically right. Now there's a third scenario. What if you cut down yellow pine trees in Georgia that have been growing, you pelletize that, you combust that in a biomass power plant with carbon capture, and you sequester that CO2 in a saline aquifer. This is, not, this is not prehistoric CO2. This is not the stuff that's been underground for millions of years. This is the CO2 that's been circling around the atmosphere through this, these trees for multiple generations. And the argument goes, and I think it's technically correct, that this is in fact a negative emissions technology. You're actually pulling CO2 out of a current cycle of CO2 in the atmosphere and sequestering it underground. So unlike solar and wind, where you've got a zero CO2 context, this is a negative emissions one. So there are in fact these negative emissions technologies that people are talking about. Pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and sticking it in cement or putting it in plastic. Uh, this is bioenergy, this biomass. There's a variety of things that are beginning to be added to these other contexts, putting it in a saline aquifer or using it for enhanced oil recovery. But these have a long way to go. All right, so let's get into the other aspect, but what about cost? The Boundary Dam project up in Saskatchewan, this is what the president of the company said, the most expensive plant because it's our first. Our next one will be 30% cheaper and we'll be going down the cost curve from there. That's the argument about how we're gonna come down the cost curve for these technologies. Yesterday in Colorado, a group of us were there at a conference at the pre-court um, institute here at Stanford is organized and probably the the leading CCS expert in the US federal government Julio Friedman said the following this is not about cost it's about finance when it comes to CCS I actually think it's about both but finance is really quite critical to progress that we need to make in CCS from a finance standpoint the smartest way to get at this would be to impose I think an economy-wide carbon tax I don't think that's happening anytime soon. So this takes us to CCS financing and policy tools. And this is what I want to conclude with. There's a whole set of mechanisms, policy and finance mechanisms, that can really, I think, help drive CCS down the cost curve and help scale up its deployment in the US and with that internationally. Grants, tax credits, loan guarantees, master limited partnerships, private activity bonds, and on from there. We're gonna cover the first five. Grants, the Department of Energy has been making major grants in the CCS context for a number of years. The project that I mentioned in Texas, for example, that got a, a large DOE grant, that's this NRG project. Another one that's still in the development stage, Summit Power, major grant there. So that's been 
an important element of getting these initial plants built. The ethanol plant in Illinois, again, Department of Energy grant money. Then there are these tax credits, and this is a complicated world of federal tax credits, but let me walk you through them very quickly. There's something called the 48A tax credit. This is, again, the Texas project, not the one being built, but a one that's being developed, not yet under construction in Texas. The 48A tax credit is an incentive on the capture end, not the sequestration end. But it's been problematic. It has all sorts of issues relative to tax credits that we readily and in large quantities provide for solar and wind. You've got to apply for the credits. They're not available automatically. The amount is limited. They're tough to use. Um, if you don't use them correctly or in time, there's something called a clawback. The IRS can pull them back, and then you're in real trouble. So the 48A tax credit has all sorts of problems. There are a variety of proposals to fix it. A few are being used, but it's not a great way to be incentivizing carbon capture. There's the 45Q tax credit. What are all these weird numbers? These are sections of the Internal Revenue Code. IR, Internal Revenue Code 45, Internal Re Revenue Code Section 48. This is one for storage. This is one for sequestration. It's basically a per ton credit for the CO2 that you put in secure geologic storage. But it has a set of problems. And there's now legislation that's about to be introduced that will deal with them. There's a cap on the number of credits you can use. The dollars per ton are really too low to stimulate what we need to do. You can't really transfer them very well to the people ultimately putting the carbon dioxide in the ground. And often the thresholds for their use are too high. And if this bill is introduced soon, and if it's ultimately adopted, it would bring those thresholds down. Loan guarantees. I think many of you heard of those. There's $8 billion currently available in the Department of Energy loan guarantee program for carbon capture. And that process is beginning to offer those loan guarantees. You've probably heard of loan guarantees with what we call the S word, Solyndra. That was a real outlier. You probably don't know that a $450 million loan guaranteed was provided for the Tesla factory here in Silicon Valley. $450 million got the, helped get the factory built and it was paid back 10 years early. You probably don't know that there's more than 30 loan guarantees that have been issued almost all of them quite successful and in fact I think you could argue that if your own investment portfolio did as well as this federal loan guarantee portfolio is doing you'd be doing quite well. 34 billion dollar portfolio 2 percent um, losses to date that's a pretty good record. We're not out of the woods there's lots of things that are still working their way through the system but this program, despite Solyndra, has a pretty good track record. And I think this $8 billion could be well spent in the carbon capture context. Master limited partnerships. Now we're really getting down into the complicated stuff. So it turns out that somewhere on the order of a half a trillion dollars worth of oil and gas pipelines in the United States have been financed using what are called master limited partnerships. This is a, a financing technique originally authorized by the Congress in the early 1980s. And it essentially merges, as this says, the tax benefit of a traditional limited partnership. That is just a single layer of taxation as opposed in a corporate context where both the corporation and the individual get taxed with the ability to issue stock. So it's a limited liability corporation that can also issue stock. So you could call up your broker today and say, I want to buy $5,000 worth of stock, they're called units, in an oil and gas pipeline. Curiously, when the law was written, renewables and lots of other things were excluded. In fact, there's a strange provision in the legislative history that says if it's a, quote, non-depletable resource, it doesn't qualify. Well, of course, a non-depletable resource is a renewable resource, although some of you know a Nobel Prize winner here at Stanford who told me one day that 
he can prove that the sun is a depleting resource and he'd draw me the five billion year curve. <laughs> I thought about taking that back to DC, but I don't think that would work well in the Senate Finance Committee. I think I would be thrown out on my ear. Anyway, so this, this uh, proposal was put into legislation. It was introduced in 2012 just for renewables. It was expanded in 2013 to extend to all sorts of other things, including carbon capture. It has very strong bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. In the House, it ranges from a, a liberal Democrat from Vermont to a very conservative Republican from the oil patch in Texas. So it's very strong support for this. Um, it got close in December when the renewable energy tax credits were extended, but they ran out of time and it was not adopted. It's going to be offered this week again in the pending energy bill. So I think one of these days that the MLP Parity Act, which would expand the authorization of the original MLP law to all these other things, including CCS, I think one of these days it will be adopted. So that's another financing tool, policy tool for CCS. Finally, what city is this? Anybody know? LA. LA. I asked this in Washington and nobody knows. <laughs> You know, I don't really remember this, but I guess LA had air that kind of looks like Beijing does today, back in the, 19, back in the 1960s um, and 70s, thank you, and 80s, <laughs> for a long time. What, what I didn't realize was how the air in LA and lots of other cities, how we actually financed the cleanup of that air using what then were pretty exotic technologies like electrostatic precipitators and flue gas desulfurization. I hadn't realized what was used were another arcane financing tool called private activity bonds. Private activity bonds. What is a private activity bond? It's a bond issued by or on behalf of a local or state government like lots of bonds are, like for a public sewage treatment plant, but for a private user. Usually when you issue bonds, it's for a big public facility, facility like a sewage treatment plant or a new water treatment plant, but this would be for private users. And the idea is you attract, you attract private investments that have a public benefit. So lots of power plants burning a lot of dirty stuff in LA in the 70s and 80s. And the thought was, we need to help them clean up. Let's use these private activity bonds, even though they're private facilities, because we're going to be, we're going to be fulfilling a public purpose, which is obviously cleaning the air. So it reduces the cost of financing because it's exempted from federal tax. That's a big deal. And you pay it back over a longer period of time than you, than you might typically. So lower interest rate, longer tenor, as we say. But strangely or not so strangely, in 1986, this authority for clean air using private activity bonds was eliminated from the tax code. We were sitting around one day here at Stanford, a group of people, one of whom was trying to develop that other carbon capture project in Texas that I've mentioned a few times, and he was bemoaning his fate. He said, you know, it's been so hard to finance this facility. I've been struggling. He said, we finally gave up on US financing. We went to China, but the, but the Chinese financing has been problematic because they want us to use their construction firm. And he was just about to throw his hands up. And someone sitting in the meeting said, well, what about private activity bonds? I, I didn't even know what a private activity bond was. And uh, we said, well, that's interesting. So we began to look at it. And we said, well, that's interesting. Maybe." Maybe we ought to think about that. Maybe we ought to take that idea back to Washington. But come to find out that that other carbon capture project in Texas was already using a private activity bond. We said, how the heck does that work? The authority went away in 1986, but they're, they're financing $140 million of this carbon capture project using a private activity bond. Well, it turns out if you're in a federal disaster zone, all these financing tools that you don't normally have access to, the federal government says, by the way, they're open. Come talk to us. And that's, in fact, what these smart people at NRG did. 
they said, ooh, maybe we could use a private activity bond because we're in a disaster zone. Now, my friend trying to develop the other Texas project, he was just outside the Hurricane Ike zone, so he didn't have access to it. And we said, this is a strange way to make public policy. You've got to wait for a hurricane <laughs> or a flood, and you've got to have the president designate an emergency. Maybe, maybe we've got to make this more predictable and consistent and change the tax code. Discovered as we dug deeper, there was another carbon capture project, and they were in another disaster zone, and this was a big one, 1.56 billion. So we went back to Washington and said, you know, this doesn't make a lot of public policy sense to be waiting for the next disaster to get access to this financing. So NRG, the developer of the project that's will be operating this year that used the private activity bond said, well, we like this. We'd be happy to write to a member of the Senate Finance Committee, Rob Portman, and talk about how useful these are and encourage him and others to support some legislation to make this change. And this was from the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of, of NRG, the largest independent power company in the United States. So lo and behold, Senator Portman and Senator Bennett, Portman from Ohio and Bennett from Colorado, Portman a Republican, Bennett a Democrat, both on the Finance Committee, and Portman also on the Energy Committee, introduced this bill called the Carbon Capture Improvement Act of now 2015. This was an earlier version, kind of an inventive title for this bill. Um, and here's the end of the story. The New York Times said, well, this is kind of interesting, kind of a back to the future approach to financing carbon capture. And it's moving. I can't sit here today and tell you it'll be adopted next week, but it's definitely getting some traction. So some key points, it would only be permitted for facilities that capture CO2. You couldn't finance an entire power plant this way. It would be for the piece of the power plant that actually captured CO2, and they, you also had to ensure that this CO2 wasn't captured and then somehow released down the road, but it actually made it into geologic sequestration. Um, as with the way we use private activity bonds today for solid waste facilities, you've got to capture a fair amount of the emission in order to be able to tax exempt finance the entire project. And if it's below the 65% cutoff, then it's um, pro rata. So if it's, you're only going to capture 25%, you only uh, get 25% in terms of the tax incentive. So it was one of these interesting ideas that kind of occurred based on a real life situation. And it was, it was exciting for me to be able to say, let's go back to DC and turn it into something real. And I, as I say, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic that, that this, the Master Limited Partnership Parity Act, which would have much broader ramifications, particularly for renewables, plus some of these fixes to tax credits, plus the grant programs, plus the uh, loan guarantee programs, we'd have a pretty good set of tools in the federal policy slash finance toolkit to move carbon capture along. So how does this help make CCS economic? Let's quickly look at two cases. One, with $80 a barrel oil. This was a case we ran not too many months ago, actually. And the column on your left is a new combined cycle gas turbine with no CCS. $55 per megawatt hour, 5.5 cents per kilowatt hour. The middle case is a combined cycle gas turbine with 90% capture, and then a coal plant with full CCS, a retrofitted coal plant, and again, a 90% capture. You can see the difference in price between those three. A combined cycle gas turbine today is really pretty cheap. You start installing capture on a, either on that gas turbine or on a coal plant, it goes up a lot, 9.5 cents, 13.4 cents. But what if you can sell the CO2 at 80 bucks a bar barrel, brings this, the combined cycle gas turbine down quite a bit, and it really brings the coal plant down because you're, you're capturing so much CO2 and selling it 
for a pretty competitive price. And then what if you can get access to these private activity bonds? You actually end up in a place where the coal plant, 90% capture, is cheaper than the combined cycle gas turbine with no capture. So from an economic perspective, it's pretty compelling. And certainly from a climate perspective, it's quite compelling given the amount of CO2 you're capturing close and, and leaving you at close to zero emissions. But here's where it gets tough. Put oil at 40 bucks a barrel. You can see you don't have the same kind of attractive situation. You still see some benefit, but it, the economics are a lot tougher um, with oil down there because CO2 and oil are linked, as I said, the way they're priced. And uh, so it, it still helps, but it doesn't get you all the way there. That's where some of these other financing tools become important. That's where ultimately a, a price on carbon can be useful. The clean power plan, the EPA's clean power plan can help drive some of this. There's a whole set of other parts of the policy and finance spectrum that could continue to push this forward. So that's kind of the, that's the price story. So let me wrap up. What the heck is that picture? <laughs> this was not a mistake. So um, in 1984, I, I went to China with a friend of mine, and we took an old collapsible <laughs> kayak. And we uh, got it in through customs. That was a little bit tricky. And our objective was to paddle in various rivers in China. And what I really wanted to do was get on the Yangtze and paddle there through the Great Gorges. I knew the dam was coming, the largest hydropower dam in the world, the largest generating station in the world at 24,000 megawatts, 24,000 megawatts. And I wanted to see the river before this, this went in. This is the guy in the front of that boat, a close friend of mine. A number of years earlier, we did a six-month trip down the the length of the, of the Rio Grande. It had never been run in its entirety. And National Geographic gave us some money to go do it. He was not the best paddler on our trip. <laughs> but he was definitely the best politician on the trip. And this is the same guy. <laughs> and you know, that, you know that boat? You see that boat? Yeah. There it is. <laughs> So, happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Well, Dan, that was great. Uh, we start with uh, questions from students, student questions in the back, usually. Oh, no? Kareem. Aha. What a surprise. Yeah. Just, a, just a clarification question. So, the PAB uh, bond that you're talking about. Does that apply for natural gas and coal? And it also applies to all the capture technologies, so pre-combustion, post-combustion, and oxy? Yes. The, as, as far as the bill is introduced? Correct. Okay. If you capture it and you meet the terms of geologic sequestration, <coughs> either saline aquifer or enhanced oil recovery, you should be able to use that financing technique. Good question. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Oh, students. You, 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 <laughs> UMC. Let's, let's see if we can get a couple more uh, students. <laughs> yeah. Sir. Yeah, so you talked a lot about uh, federal policy. Are there states that are doing, uh, taking steps to help finance this stuff? Well, it's a great question. And um, th um, there's not a lot at this point, but there are some states, you know, Wyoming, a couple of the states where there's lots of coal power plants. There's certainly some things that public utility commissions have been doing to, to help accelerate this. There has been quite a bit of discussion about whether carbon capture ought to be added to state renewable portfolio standards. They ought to be called state clean energy standards. That's quite controversial. Um, but I think um, that's something that's been, been discussed. Um, so. I won't sit here and tell you there's been a huge amount of activity at the state level, but I think you're going to see it increasing, particularly in places, as I say, where, where, where coal power, where natural gas fire generation um, 
is, is a major component of the electricity mix. Looking for another student question. No more student questions. Okay. Okay. okay let's answer. let's do that one and then Alex after that. How binding are the sequest? <laughs> how watertight are the sequest uh, sequestration standards of making sure that the CO two stays out of circulation for a long, long time? Great question. <laughs> um, there are. I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I am the expert on how that is managed, but you have to do make a showing under some different federal regulations about what you're going to do in terms of ge geologic sequestration. Um, anybody know the answer to that? Sally, Sally probably does. What's that? Sorry. What, what, what governs from a technical <laughs> standpoint? You, what, what do you have to prove um, about the CO2 staying where you put it? You have to prove you have a good seal. Good seal. And there's a variety of EPA regulations that govern this. There's a whole set of things, but I'm not going to try to walk you through how those there's work at this point. There's an extensive set through the, um, the underground injection control program. There's a whole class six right. regulations around these wells, including monitoring and verification. It's very elaborate. So it's the safe drinking water has something called the underground injection provisions, UIC permits. There's something called subpart RR. There's a whole set of things you've got to go through. Those in and of themselves have some controversy around them. But I'm, I think EPA has done a pretty good job of setting up, that, setting up that program to give people decent assurance that what you put in the ground is going gonna, is gonna to stay there. OK, Alex. So uh, well, if you look at Aliso Canyon, uh, we actually don't have a very good record in California being mm -hmm. able to keep anything underground. <laughs> uh, That's a subject for a subsequent <laughs> seminar. Yeah, so one accident out of, you know, uh, you know, probably 50 or 60 years. So what's a Liso Canyon, well, just so Aliso folks know? And you, you probably don't know, it's leaking uh, Oh, well, Porter the current Ranch. one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Porter Ranch. Right, right. I know it is Porter, Porter Ranch. Ranch. Yeah. And, but Porter Ranch, which is in the Liso. leakage. That's what the state tells us. A quarter of all of the uh, carbon that's being yeah. emitted. So it's and, gigantic. Right, it's gigantic. So my question is, the private activity bond for this is a good idea. It's, it's public good. But what about all these other details? I mean, there's a lot of different policy and everything, and I know people like policy and, and Washington and everything. Makes them feel good. But the point is that energy <coughs> coal plants produce a huge amount of very dangerous ash every year. Is that included in the requirement to sequester the result of their operation? Because we got 100 million tons that Duke Energy has that gets into rivers. So this, is, this doesn't cover coal ash, but as you know, EPA has you know, extensive regulatory authority. There's a variety of federal programs. But I, I'm not going to sit here today that, to tell you that in any way that this has a lot to say about coal ash. You know, there's no doubt that, that coal, gas, you know, there's a whole set of issues with most of our energy technologies. Um, and what I'm talking about today is, is not addressing that, that, that full range. Right, but that's part of the public concept is you're trying to address something that's going to deal with a problem that this system creates. But if you're not dealing with all the problems that the system creates, you're playing a game. Right. There's a broader context in which every one of these energy technologies sits. And so that has to be taken into to consideration as you think about extending the life of a coal plant or shutting it down, extending the life of a gas plant or requiring something new that goes on a gas plant when it gets built. You know, what do you do with an ethanol plant? Um, you know, obviously we, we have issues around citing renewables. There's a set of things, as you know, with every, with every one of these energy technologies. Don't, that, don't they have to go through an environmental impact statement? Oh, absolutely. They construct, so they, it so, conceivably, it should conceivably get in there. And, and, and to, the extent, to the extent that NEPA would be implicated, the National Environmental Policy Act, for example, in a grant for a carbon capture project, you know, it, it may well be. And, David Hayes would, would know this better than I, that you'd have to look at some of these related issues if, in fact, there's either a state or a federal environmental review that has to be done. David, did you want to say anything on that? No. No? OK. <laughs> <laughs> you have to seek advice from your attorney. Let's go here and there, and then I think we're out. Sir? Are there certain geological formations that are needed or are preferable for the sequestration, and are they widespread throughout the country? The, what I understand, the 
folks who I speak to at the Energy Department and elsewhere, Sally. and Sally knows this well, uh, yeah, there are a variety of geologic settings that are appropriate for this. Um, it's a pretty big opportunity spatially and in terms of the volume of, of CO2 that you'd need to sequester, and there's places where you wouldn't want to put it. And I think between the US Geologic Service and, and, and DOE and experts like Sally at universities like that, we have a pretty good handle on, on where you'd want to put it and where you wouldn't. OK, last question back here. So given all these financing techniques require a revenue stream to either service the debt or whatever over time, I, clearly it works with the oil recovery because you've got a price. Uh, are there other s sources of revenue if you're in, either in a region where oil recovery is not really there or whatever, are there other revenue, potential revenue streams in addition to oil recovery that might be used to, to service the debt? At this point, there are very few. And that becomes the challenge. The only today larger volume economical use of CO2 or a way to pay for carbon capture like this is in the enhanced oil recovery context. If some of these other uses of CO2, you know, as I've said, cement production, there are a couple of startups that think you can sequester it in cement and, you know, derive revenues from that context or put it into plastics. If we set, again, if we set a broader CO2 limit in this country, if we put a tax on carbon emissions, you drive those economics. But that's the big that's the big challenge. You've asked the exact right question. Um, in the absence of something economic you can do with the CO2 today, other than enhanced oil recovery, in the absence of a real serious price on CO2, this is a technology that's got economic challenges. Um, but in the case of many other energy technologies over the decades, that's where the federal government has stepped in to kind of bring these technologies down the cost curve, get them deployed, and ultimately get them to a point where they can better stand on their own. But even our well-developed technologies today that have been powering this country for decades and decades still enjoy various kinds of federal, federal support. Look at nuclear, look at coal, look at gas, look at a variety of things. So it's not a simple situation, but I think it's one that where we're, we're taking some at least decent steps so far to, to drive this into more economic and a more economic posture. Well, we're just about out of time, so thanks for a spellbinding talk, and thanks to the audience. Thanks.